Hi, I'm Andy Rudolph from Intel. Uh, I'm the lead persistent memory software architect at Intel. I'm also a member of the SNEA NVM Programming Technical Work Group, where I help define the persistent memory programming model. Um, today, I'm talking to you as a member of the CXL Consortium, where I'm going to talk about how we added persistent memory support to CXL 2.0. Uh, now, as a quick reminder, uh, persistent memory today on machines that are shipping today and products that are, that are available now uh, before CXL is available, they work by connecting to the memory bus. They plug into the DDR slots, uh, products like the NVDIM-Ns that are available today, plug in and speak DDR just like they are uh, a DRAM memory uh, device. Uh, Intel's Optane uh, speaks DDRT, which is a proprietary protocol uh, over those same electricals. So that's how it works today. Now, the benefit of persistent memory, uh, we kind of put together this pyramid slide here at the top of the pyramid where you can see, uh, you know, caches in the CPU and DRAM. Those are in the single digit or double digit latencies of nanoseconds. Um, you know, SSDs and disks, you can see now the latency is getting into the 10 to the fourth, 10 to the fifth, 10 to the sixth latencies. But there's this gap in the middle and that's what persistent memory does. It fills that gap. It provides us with a media for data that is you know, older than what you would put in DRAM or it needs to be persistent, uh, but it's warmer than what you would put in the persistence. So it needs to be a lower latency. So, um, System memory, you can see, is uh, really going to fit nicely into CXL when CXL is available um, because uh, CXL allows you to move the persistent memory off the, the DRAM memory bus and out onto this uh, standardized bus with standardized management of the memory and the, and the CXL interface, uh, not to mention uh, support for a, a variety of form factors. Um, so, talking a little more about background of persistent memory, uh, if you've ever seen a talk on persistent memory uh, by me or by lots of people, uh, you may have seen this programming model slide, which I snipped from a, a SNEA presentation. And we usually focus on the right-hand side of this slide, where we talk about giving an application direct access to the persistent memory. But what we don't talk about as much is how does the operating system know that there's persistent memory installed in the system and how does it manage it? So to do that, uh, there's a table in ACPI called NFIT, the NVDIM Firmware Interface Table. And the NFIT table, which we added to ACPI 6.0, uh, it exposes the existence of persistent memory to the operating system, causing it to load up whatever drivers it needs to load up and, and provide the programming model I'm showing here. When those drivers need to manage the persistent memory, they use these device specific methods. Uh, in ACPI terminology, it's usually written underscore DSM like I'm showing here. And so between the NFIT as input and the, the device specific methods, a lot of the details of persistent memory are abstracted away by the BIOS. The BIOS has to know all the vendor specifics. So if you use a DSM to say upgrade firmware on your device, the BIOS has to know for the vendor's uh, device, what, what uh, uh, mailbox commands or whatever else type of communication does it does that DSM turn into. And this has been a little bit of a pain point for us because it's really not possible to make a BIOS support multiple system memory devices because it's got all this vendor specific information in there. You'd have to get you know, multiple vendors to contribute to a single BIOS, which is kind of problematic. Um, and NFIT itself, uh, it's an ACPI table, but it's not that dynamic. Uh, uh, there, there are facilities in there for hot plug. That you kind of have to know about all the available sockets ahead of time. Uh, if you have a bus that's like PCIe, which is hot plug and can have switches added to it and, and really scales out, ACPI doesn't scale out as well. So we set out to learn from these experiences and use the good things, but also try and solve some of our pain points. 
Um, so now let's talk about Compute Express Link or CXL. It's a new class of interconnect. I, there's a, a CXL consortium that drives its definition. You can see all the logos from the board of directors here. But, uh, the key part of the slide is that there are over 150 member companies and it's an open industry standard for a cash coherent interconnect. Um, I grabbed one of the training slides here from their site and it talks about it being high bandwidth and low latency. And of course, those are very key components. I really wanted to point out this bottom uh, major bullet here. It's based on the PCIe uh, electricals. In other words, you'll have machines that have these slots that are essentially PCIe slots, or they can be CXL slots. And over those electricals, these are the three protocols that are defined in the CXL spec, CXL.io, CXL.cache, and CXL.mem. And I'm gonna talk mostly about IO and MEM here. You'll see why on the next slide. Uh, but first, just let me give you a little timeline on the left here. Uh, CXL 1.1 was released, that specification was released in June of 2019. Uh, then I got involved in adding the persistent memory support, CXL, the CXL 2.0 spec. Uh, we released that spec in November of last year of 2020. Uh, it's backward compatible with 1.1, but it adds the support for persistent memory amongst a bunch of other things. Uh, the specs are open to, to anyone to read. You can see them at computexpresslink.org. Um, in the spec, there are three representative CXL usages uh, referred to as type one, type two, and type three devices. And you can see type one and type two devices uh, have the word accelerator in their diagrams. So these are really about different types of accelerators and CXL is very well formed uh, you know, to be an accelerator connect point. Um, I'm gonna concentrate today on this right one, uh, which is labeled memory buffer. Um, it's for expanding the system's main memory uh, in a way that, that uh, allows you to add memory by adding uh, CXL type three devices. And you can see uh, that really uh, fits well with this idea of adding persistent memory to the system. So that's why I'm focusing on, the, on type three. That's where persistent memory fits in. So um, let's talk about what we added to the persistent memory, um, to the CXL specification to, uh, to support persistent memory. Uh, first, some kind of high-level uh, bullets uh, to, to, to summarize. Um, so we wanted to make sure that as we added things that applied to persistent memory devices, if these ideas also applied to non-persistent memory devices, that we didn't have two versions of them. There shouldn't be one way of identifying a volatile memory device and another way of identifying a persistent memory device. So you'll see when I get into the details, most of the changes apply to all memory devices, and we only made MM specific changes when, when it really made sense to. Um, instead of using ACPI to find these devices, they're enumerated in the normal way uh, PCIe devices are enumerated. You know, the, the NFIT table that we added for NVDIMs, the N stands for NVDIMs. These are not NVDIMs, these are CXL devices. And we wanted to leverage these very mature PCIe frameworks that have been around for years. Uh, these frameworks know how to do all the PCIe mechanics of finding devices and rebalancing the bus. Uh, they understand things like hot plug and switches and so on. So we really wanted to leverage that and, and not go and reinvent uh, another ACPI table or anything like that. Uh, next, we added some MMIO, some memory mapped IO registers uh, that define a mailbox interface. Now, these are the commands that you can send to these type three devices. And remember, I was, I was saying how these commands were abstracted away for, for uh, NVDMs uh, because they're all vendor private commands. Well, that was a real pain point for us and managing those device specific methods, those DSMs was a big pain point. So we decided to get rid of all the DSMs and now uh, these, these uh, commands are now public standardized commands instead of vendor private. Um, we are also producing an ancillary document called the Driver Writer's Guide, delivered as a separate document. I'm gonna explain uh, what's in there in a couple slides. Uh, we've also made some minor changes to some of the other standards, ACPI and UEFI, but they're very minor compared to the, the major work that we did in the CXL spec itself. Um, so let's talk about the mailbox commands. 
as we started sorting through the mailbox commands that we had invented for the uh, you know, DDR-based um, uh, uh, persistent memory, we realized a lot of these commands are kind of generally useful. They're useful to any CXL device, even an accelerator or, or what have you. Uh, so uh, we uh, started by making a table of uh, commands that are uh, useful to any CXL device. You can see them on the right. They're things like uh, update your firmware or uh, set the timestamp or you know, get logs, things like this. So these things were vendor private, now they're public. And you know, by making things standard, there's kind of a double-edged sword there. Um, you get these nice standard compliant generic drivers that work for everybody's device. On the other hand, if you decide that you need another command, you have to go visit a committee. You can't just add it. Um, it generally turns out to be a good thing. The committee scrutinizes the command. Um, it uh, usually ends up um, in a better place because it's more generic with all that, that scrutiny and all that review. Um, learnings that we got from our NVD, NVDM work really helped us. We, we really tried to leverage the things that worked and tried to fix the, the things that didn't work. So these commands on the right are the ones, this is just a snippet from the spec. You can read all of their details in the, in the specification itself. These are the commands that apply to all CXL devices. Most of the commands that we added apply only to the memory devices. And uh, like I said before, the DSMs now are gone and the OS just follows the standard and uses the mailbox directly, so does the BIOS. It's moved a lot of complexity out of the BIOS. Um, we dumped all that DSM code and it adds some complexity to the OS, but it's easier for us to manage the complexity there. You can see on the right how some of the commands are required for all memory devices, like this identify memory device command has an M there, which means it's mandatory for all memory devices. And some of the commands like this get label storage area command, which I'll describe in a minute, only applies to persistent memory. So we put a little PM in the table there. So again, the table is much bigger than I could fit on a slide and the details are in the spec. But let's just kind of go into an example, like the identify memory device command. Well, you can see the output payload gives you things like the firmware revision, total capacity of the device, how much volatile capacity it has, how much persistent capacity it has, and so on. So that gives you a flavor of how these mailbox commands work and how we made them generic. Um, so uh, specs are written in terse spec language. And uh, we felt that uh, we really needed another guide that helped show the intention behind these things. And besides, um, CXL is platform neutral. Uh, of course, I work for Intel, so I'm concentrated on how CXL works on Intel platforms, but that may be different from how it works on an ARM platform or a power platform, for example. So we wrote this driver writer's guide to explain how all the pieces fit together, how things are intended to be used, and you know, the roles that different parts of an Intel platform play, like what parts are done by the BIOS, what parts are done by the OS, and so on. Uh, Chet Douglas, the author of this spec, writes these beautiful flow diagrams. And I can't, you know, I don't expect you to be able to read this on the slide, but you'll be able to go read it in the spec. Um, and he color codes the different boxes, say what component is taking these actions and the blue things are the data structures they're acting on. And these are really, they're just beautiful flows that really help clarify how this is all supposed to work together and tells a driver writer or a BIOS writer what they need to know in order to implement this. So this spec, it's, it's currently under review right now. Uh, it'll be published on intel.com within a few weeks of, of this uh, um, conference. Um, okay, let's talk about some of the hard stuff that had to happen. So interleaving is one of the more interesting problems that we had to tackle. CIE devices have been around forever, but an interleave set that interleaves memory across PCIe devices, that's new. And that is achieved by this mechanism called HDM decoders. It's part of CXL. HDM stands for host managed device memory. And the decoders are the little registers you program that uh, configure the interleaving across the type three memory device. So this is a new concept for PCIe. Um, and it's actually very important that we find this concept very carefully. You know, for volatile memory, if you add some volatile memory and you decide to interleave one uh, way, like uh, with a, I don't know, a 1K interleaf granularity, and then you reboot the system and come back and say, no, I'm gonna do a 4K interleaf granularity, everything still works fine. 
it might perform slightly differently, but there's no semantic difference as far as software is concerned. For persistent memory, you've got to interle interleave it the same way every time or else you lose access to your data. This is very similar to striping across a RAID set. If you stripe differently, uh, every time you reboot, you'll lose your data because you know it's persistent. It's called persistent memory for a reason. So to support this, we introduced this idea of a label storage area on each device. We defined it in the, in the spec and it provides these labels that define uh, interleave sets, which we call regions, and also namespaces, which are similar to NVM Express namespaces. Uh, just to kind of give you an idea of what these look like, uh, here's a quick diagram. Again, you can find a lot more detail, including this diagram in Chad's driver's uh, writer's guide. Uh, here I'm showing a CXL host bridge with a couple of switches plugged into it, and each switch has four devices. That's the round blue things. And if you look at these gray boxes, they show you the logical block numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So this is an eight-way interleave set across eight devices. And the labels are down at the bottom. And you can see the label tells you how many devices are in the interleave set, each device's position in that set, and the interleave granularity. This allows the OS to reassemble the interleave set and also detect problems like, are we missing a component or is it misconfigured? Um, plug was another one of these challenges. So um, we, we decided to make the hot plug uh, to uh, limit the BIOS complexity to make it handled completely by the operating system. And the operating system uses these windows that are provided by the BIOS that are shown in these little diagrams here. Again, a lot more detail about this is in the driver writer's guide. But the upside of this is you can hot plug one of these devices and the OS can add it to an interleave set without involving the BIOS at all. And this worked so well for hot plug it simplified things so well that we actually just decided to use it for all PMEM. And so all PMEM is actually configured by the OS like this, with the exception of the, the, the boot device, if you happen to boot from PMEM. So let me go on and talk about the state of software enabling. We're going very fast because we're time limited. So I'm kind of giving you the whirlwind tour. The momentum on CXL is huge. For NVDEMS, it was just a few of us sitting in a room coming up with what we wanted to add to ACPI. For CXL, it's dozens of highly engaged companies, including all the operating system vendors, OEMs and ISVs and device manufacturers. A lot of uh, excitement there. The preliminary generic driver for type three memory devices is already upstream in Linux. Uh, this was orchestrated by the owner of the NVDIM framework, uh, Dan Williams, who is leading this effort to implement things on, uh, for CXL on Linux. Um, a lot of this work was done early before CXL even existed uh, using a version of the QEMU emulator that was provided by Ben Wadowski who added the emulation of a type three device. And that allowed a lot of this work to happen very early and really get a, get a jump on this stuff, getting it upstream very early. Um, there's a lot of cross company and, and cross committee uh, collaboration on this. It's actually uh, really uh, exciting to watch. Uh, the challenges have been around, well, you know, we kind of thought persistent memory enabling was all done. We had done all these specs in ACPI and defined these drivers. CXL is going to require a new set of drivers like I have been laying out. Um, it's not clear how easy these drivers are going to be able to be ported to older kernels. Um, however, um, that's really, you know, uh, up to the, to the individual uh, distros, for example, on Linux. Uh, the tooling will, will also have to evolve. There's an NVDIM command on Linux called NDCTL, and that will get a new command, a CXL related command, for doing things like setting up uh, persistent memory devices, configuring regions, and so on. Um, so, in summary, uh, the programming model slide that I showed you, it remains the same. If you've written an application for persistent memory on today's persistent memory, it will work without modification, it will work without recompiling on CXL attached persistent memory. We made sure to preserve the programming model. CXL offers uh, the ability to move persistent memory off the memory bus and scale it up to all different types of memory in, in a much more flexible way. And the uh, details are all published in this public CXL 2.0 spec that's available on the CXL website. And the OS enabling is, is emerging right now. So that's my talk, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please take a moment to rate the session and uh, thanks for listening.